Wilson. I'm the VP of Conservation Engagement for the Wildlife Conservation Network, and I'm wonderfully excited to have you all here with us today. As you know, our mission is to protect endangered wildlife, and one of the ways that we do that is through our support of some of the world's best conservationists, such as Augustino and Colleen. Today, we're going to focus on coexistence and what that means. One thing that's important to Agostino and Colleen of the Niasa Lion Project is that authentic connection, what they have with the local communities, as well as with all of you. It's our hope today that those connections will lead us to some incredibly authentic and thoughtful conversations. Niasa Lion Project protects 800 lions in one of their last strongholds. Niasa Special Reserve Mozambique is one of the most important wilderness areas and lion populations in Africa today. The NLP team, which is made up of 112 permanent staff, approximately 250 seasonal staff, and then an additional 47 or so guardians, so a large number of people. Um, they work closely with the communities that live inside the protected areas to find alternative livelihoods to poaching and bushmeat consumption, reducing conflict with lions, and including the communities in the conservation decision-making, monitoring, and benefit sharing. The reserve management team uh, works closely with these communities to find locally derived sustainable solutions that allow lions and people to live together and thrive. Today we have with us soon to be Dr. Agostino George and Dr. Colleen Begg. Agostino has worked with NLP since 2008 and in 2010 he obtained his master's in South Africa studying leopards. He's currently and almost finished with his PhD on bushmeat studies. It's just a few months away, so big congrats to you, Agostino, for all of your accomplishments there. Uh, he's a former WCN scholar and took part in a two-year program for emerging wildlife conservation leaders. Agostino leads all NIASA's conservation monitoring programs, surveys, and anti-poaching efforts to, review, to reduce bushmeat snaring. He's an expert in peace building and plays a major leadership and mentorship role in NIASA. Agostino cares deeply about people and carnivores and is determined to make a difference in people's lives through conservation. Dr. Colleen Begg is a South African conservation ecologist with more than 25 years experience in grassroots conservation and community engagement. She's passionate about securing African wilderness areas and large carnivore populations by inspiring transparent, locally derived and collaborative conservation actions. She co-founded the Niasa Lion Project in 2003 and is an alumna of Homeward Bound, a global leadership initiative for a thousand women with STEM backgrounds. They aim to heighten influence and the impact of women in making decisions that shape our planet. In 2018, she co-founded Women for the Environment Africa, or WE Africa. It's a transformational leadership program for African women conservation leaders whose purpose is to put women at the heart of transforming Africa's environmental movement. With that, today's closer look is going to be a little bit different than normal, and we'll have more time for that conversation piece of things. So I sincerely hope that you will have brought your questions for Agostino and Colleen, and that you're ready for what promises to be a stimulating discussion. Colleen will share a few slides to anchor us in that conversation, and as you watch them, I hope you will consider, consider how this works with your own experiences and in your own life. What does coexistence mean to you? Um, we get a lot of hearing from our conservationists, but one thing that's important to note is they get a lot from hearing from you. Um, I know that we all thrive on those conversations, conservation conversations, um, so do please share your thoughts with us. Um, I'm hand it over to Colleen here in a minute, but you can drop your questions into the Q&A or into the chat and we'll pull those and have a nice chat once we learn a bit more about coexistence and we'll go from there. Colleen, over to you. Thank you, Kelly. It's wonderful to be here with WCN and all of you. And I'm very appreciative of WCN allowing us to push the boundaries a little and do things a little bit differently. And before I share my screen, I just wanted to say why I think that's important. You know, when we're dealing with climate change and the climate emergency and biodiversity loss, it's increasingly important that conservation is not this um, sort of uh, 
thing that somebody does far, far away from you in a country which seems very romantic and these strange people who run around in the bush and live in tents. It's really important that it integrates all of us, that it's not just a fringe activity and that all of us are engaged in conservation, whether it's just outside our front door or whether it's half a world away. And I think that these conversations are important. We are conservationists, and I know that you are too. You're here with us today. And I really think that when we are able to have an authentic, um, unstructured conversation about conservation, then we can all learn together from each other. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, hopefully, let's see if this works. That working? There we are. Okay, so as, as Kelly said, um, we are a big team. We are 112 people, um, all Mozambican except for Keith and I and Ken, who helps with some special projects. We have PhDs, we are non literate, we are young, we are old, we are women, and we are men. We are teachers, farmers, uh, carpenters, biologists drivers, cooks. Um, we are a really complex, inclusive, diverse team, and that's where innovation lies. And I know it's very important to Agostino and to me to make sure that you realize that while we're here talking to you today, we represent a much bigger team, and it's their voices that we hope to bring into this conversation, and hopefully one day you can come and see us in the ASA, because it's all these different perspectives that helps us talk about coexistence and help us talk about conservation. So the Nyasa Lion Project actually is the Nyasa Carnival Project. We also work on spotted hyenas, leopards, and African wild dogs, although lions anchor us in our work. And we serve to conserve these large carnivals and their prey in the Nyasa Special Reserve, which I'll talk about in a moment, by promoting coexistence, and, and there's that word, and a shared respect for people, their culture, wildlife, and the environment. And so many conservation organizations have coexistence in their mission statement. We talk about it all the time. We're trying to help people coexist so that people and wildlife can thrive. But I think that the more that we go along this journey, the more we start to interrogate what this actually means. We work in a very special place. Nyasa Special Reserve is in northern Mozambique. It's 16,000 square miles, 42,000 square kilometers. It's the size of Switzerland. All of South Africa's protected areas fit into this one protected area. It is managed in a co-management agreement with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the government of Mozambique. And it has a number of other partners that are there doing, bringing their skills to complement the work of the, of the Mozambique government. It is spectacularly beautiful. And after 20 years there, I still am blown away by these granite insulbergs that rise up above the Miyamba wilderness um, with these gorgeous dry riverbeds, as well as the Legenda and the Ruvuma River and all the wildlife that protects there. If you look at a map there, that green is Nyasa Special Reserve. It's on the border with Tanzania and sits midway between the coast at Pemba and Lake Malawi, which is called Lake Nyasa in, in Mozambique. That little yellow, yellow bit in the green there, that's a concession that we manage um, in collaboration with a community of 2,000 people. And that's where our headquarters is based. Nyasa yeah, is very important for lions, as Kelly said. It's one of the seven most important populations of lions left in Africa today. It has the potential to increase to about 1,000 to 2,000 lions, perhaps, if we're lucky. At the moment, it's sitting between 800 and 1,000 lions, and these lions are declining. But the thing about Nyasa that is extraordinary is that it is one of the only large places in Africa where people have never been removed from the protected area. This paradigm or conservation paradigm of fortress conservation, which actually started in the US and has become the sort of normal way of doing conservation with protected areas. In most of those areas, the people who lived there were removed and people and nature were separated. 
in the answer that never happened, and we have 50 to 60,000 people that are living inside the protected area who have always lived there, and this is their home. And there's no better image that I've ever taken that represents us better than this one. So this is a lion called Kampul, which just means an open space. He was the first lion that we ever collared. And when we were sitting in the Land Rover waiting for him to wake up to go and see where he was going to move to and what he was going to catch for his food, and lions sleep for 18 hours a day, so there's a lot of downtime, we were looking at the rock above him and noticed that there were these red marks on the rock. And for a long time through our binoculars and our cameras, we couldn't figure out if those were wasp nests or whether they were paintings. After the line moved up and we rushed out there to have a look, we realized these were indeed paintings and they are believed to be 4,000 year old Batwa pygmy paintings. To see a lion lying under these ancient paintings is exactly what coexistence is about. People, li people and lions have co-evolved in Africa and have always been in this wilderness together. But that doesn't mean it's peaceful. Lions are not easy to live with. They're scary. And I don't know how many of you have been to Africa and have seen how a lion's behavior changes at night. This is a lion that was directly looking at me during a collapse survey. And there's nothing that makes you feel more part of nature than looking into a lion's eyes at night when you become their prey. Here we are in 2022 and 2023. And people are still getting killed by lions. Last year, after a long period of managing to get the man-eating under control in the Asa, we were very sadly had four people killed in the Asa Reserve by lions and another person injured. These kinds of events are traumatic. They are told many years afterwards and they become the very fabric of society, as told and retold. People are living in very close proximity to lions. Those red dots are a lion that is radio colored around a village in the middle there of 2,000 people. People are walking through their fields at night and lions are close by. This lion actually now has her cubs um, in, a, in a rocky sort of mountain quite close by to where some people have their field. Last year, in late last year, we held a workshop where we brought together people with lived experience with lions, the people who live in the Asa Reserve, which is 85% of our staff, and people with learned experience of lions, the Mozambican scientists who were working in various capacities in the reserve, who had come to do conservation. We wanted to bring together all these different skills and ideas and see if we could come up with some new ideas. Azebio, who was here, he's here on the left-hand side of this picture, was, was talking to Mama Abisi. Azebio runs our line program and our line monitoring and rapid reaction. And Mama Bibi Amisi was telling a story of how in the 1990s, she woke up at night in a field to her husband being dragged off by a lion. Everybody was, um, she's a natural storyteller and sitting under these mango trees. And she tells of how she grabbed a piece of firewood and she chased off the lion. And he was, her husband was badly injured. She managed to get some people around her to help. And they were carrying the lion back to the clinic in the village. The lion followed them. They tried to shoot the lion, they couldn't. And they had to get some of the, the, um, the spirit mediums and the, and the sacred, um, uh, the, the, the healers to be able to come and deal with the lion in place. What's extraordinary about the story is that when we asked her about how she felt about lions, she didn't say, I wish all the lions were gone. She didn't say that my life would be easier without lions. She said, I should have been sleeping in a safe shelter. They've always lived with lions. And now she takes a small little plastic container with her to bed at night on a raised shelter so that she doesn't have to walk, a lion, walk around at night where the lions are. People know how to live with lions. In the 1650s, a ship was um, shipwrecked off the coast of Mozambique and people walked into, some of these missionaries walked into a community um, from, from the beach and found people living on these houses on stilts and asked, you know, why are you living like that? What, why are you creating these shelters called sanjas? And they were told even then we sleep on these, these houses with stilts because it keeps us safe from lions. The elders in Nyasa know exactly how to live with lions. 
And part of our education campaigns have not been trying to find new techniques, but to remind some of the youngsters in the villages that the elders have always known how to do this and have been able to increase the number of people that are now living in safe shelters like this, which are perfectly safe from lions at night. And of course, conservation is complex. The lions are declining because we have this, largely because we have this illegal trade in lion parts, skins and teeth that are going to Vietnam and Cambodia and China. We have lions caught in bushmeat. And these are hard threats to be able to find solutions for. The start is always to have anti-poaching scouts. We, we employ men um, and women from the communities around us who are going out on patrol, pulling out snares, and are able to monitor the wildlife that they see. We also have livelihoods programs where people are able to, to earn a living from different livelihoods so that they don't have to get it from wildlife. Here's um, one of the mamas that we know really well, Mama Ibu, who has earned some money from grass, about $40,000 a year is, is made from grass so that, they, um, that we use in all our buildings. These help lift people's well-being so that they have some money for emergencies and they can buy the goods that they need. But more than anything, we realize that coexistence is about conversations. It's about the stories that are told by the elders when they're talking together about living in these wilderness areas. It's about the connection to the land and the sacred site. It's about reaffirming for the children about this beautiful place that they call home, where their ancestors are buried and where their futures will be and how much they care about it. It's about the stories that come out in theater and song and dance about lions that have always been there that connect people to wildlife. We even see these stories of coexistence in artworks that are created by the Kushirika Craft Group. And even when you look at these embroidery works, which are these magnificent biodiversity quilts, you can see people and wildlife are integrated into these complex ways, which are part of the very fabric of society. There are sacred sites that are, are, are all over Nyasa Reserve where people revere many of the animals that they'll also create problems for them in their fields. This is a very special sacred site called Chimambo, um, where the yellow baboons are believed to be the ancestors. And so after 20 years in Nyasa and all these conversations and the various ways that we do conservation, we've realized that coexistence is firstly not peaceful, it's also not simple. It's like this basket that is woven of all these little pieces and strands that come together to hold people and their wildlife in the place that they call home. And I wonder um, now when I look around us, if what we are missing in our own lives and our own cities and across the world is that we've lost that connection with the places that we're in. And then we start to see wildlife as only a problem or something to go and see on a holiday, but not part of nature. We've separated the two. And so I hope that we can have a conversation about this. I think that we can also, we're happy to answer any other questions you might have. And um, thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to, to talk to you. Can't hear you. <laughs> I'm notorious for not turning off my mute button. You can ask anybody at WCN. It happens more frequently than I would care to admit. Um, thank you for that, Colleen. It was a great grounding in what coexistence is and what it means. And you just speak so wonderfully about the people you work with. It's it's just always such a pleasure. Um, I want to remind everybody that we do have Augustino here as well. His internet connection in Niasa was kind of coming out a bit. So he is off video, but he is here to help answer your questions and to help have this conversation about coexistence. So um, I kind of just want to start off and maybe you can talk about, Colleen, maybe you can talk about what coexistence was like, you know, before you and Keith got to Niasa. How has it changed over the last however many years that you've been there? What do you, what's your experience with that? 
So I think I think Niasa hasn't changed so much. I mean, I think it, it has obviously in many ways. When we first arrived there, there were only fifteen thousand people, and they're now sixty thousand people, and and there's been a lot of insecurity. But I think the thing that's changed the most is is me, um, is Keith and I, and and I think Agustina will agree, is that the more time we spend there, and the more we realize the depth of people's connections to the land and to and to this this very deep history that they have for this place, the more it's changed our ideas of what coexistence is. You know, we come from, I particularly come from South Africa, and so I was trained at university in fortress conservation. That's how you did conservation. You you know, you put a fence around, you put the boundary around, you kicked all the people out, and, and humans weren't part of, of this narrative. And I've had to undo all my thinking about that. And I absolutely firmly and and yeah, I now believe and can see that the only possible future for conservation is actually proper coexistence where people have some decision making power and, and know how to live with these these animals. So I think it's me that's changed more than Niasa. It's hard to tell. Agustino, have your views on coexistence changed over the years with your experiences? Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, so my my mind has expanded a lot, and I kind of uh, started seeing things that were not obvious uh, before. And uh, yeah, I think it, I I came to realize that uh, uh, the system in Yase has been built on coexistence for hundreds of years, and that's something that. Uh, that has the potential to keep the system going for an, for a few more hundreds of years. So we do not we do not have to invent the wheel. So the the principles are there. I think what we have to do is to learn how to keep this system going. How can we empower people to help uh, these animals? So this is something that we have been uh, trying to learn as much as we can. Fantastic. Um, we have a question here from Leandra. Are people living with lions in the same area? Is it really human wildlife conflicts? What are the alternatives? Yeah, so they're definitely living, they, they're they all living absolutely together. So um, so we do have the villages where, where people try and, you know, for example, one of the villages that we work with, they built a trench, so they dug a, a trench around their village recently with, with some help from us um, to keep elephants and buffalo out of out of the actual houses where they, where they live. But there are lions and elephants and buffalo and people everywhere. Um, and obviously, the the simplest way to to resolve the conflict is, you know, goat kraals. We don't have cattle, so one of the good things about Niasa is, you know, one of the main conflicts you find in other areas is between lions and cattle. There's no cattle because they're tasty flies, and there's the cattle die. But we do have goats, so you know, it's corralling your animals, sleeping in safe shelters. Um, but that's only like the first part of of resolving conflict because there are disasters. You know, we have people killed by lions. We had to kill a lion last year. Um, Ezebio had to go out with a team and kill a, a sub-adult lion that had killed someone. And so I, I think that the most important thing to remember is that it's not peaceful. Coexistence isn't peaceful. And it goes through moments where people get injured and moments where lions get hurt. But in the long term, people find a way to to balance that and find some sort of balance that works. Absolutely. You kind of answered this question already, but I just wanted to share one of the comments is that one thing anonymous says, one thing that stands out to me is that in the US, we understandably don't have tolerance for human death. If an animal seems to even get too close to a human, we kill them. Um, and then they were asking if animals that kill humans in the reserve are killed. And that's that was the answer that you just gave. But I wanted to kind of share that comparison to the US because this is something we deal with here as well. May it mountain lions or bears or you know, other large carnivores. And it, it is something that we have to learn about as well. Um, Michelle's asking, is the government supportive of your work in this area? Agustina, would you like to answer? 
Uh, yes, yes, thank you. So I think uh, uh, maybe I will start by saying that we work in probably one of the most complex systems in Africa and uh, where there are about 6,000 people, like uh, Colin said. Uh, and um, to me, it is kind of rewarding when we start getting uh, some messages from government uh, saying that we, we are struggling with a leopard here. We need your support to deal with these animals. We are struggling with hyena here. And um, so I think that's, uh, that, that is a positive sign that they are not basically trying to take the matter on their own. So they recognize that there is an organization which is, is specialized on carnivore work and they are in a better position to deal with that. So, uh, and also they are very supportive in, in the sense that um, we have been working together in many initiatives. So Colleen mentioned in her presentation about education. So education and uh, also even uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, small livestock. So they basically help, they, they help us uh, 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 getting some vaccines to for chickens. Newcastle is a major problem. So we have problems of uh, uh, food insecurity and people often lose a lot of animals, a lot, lot of chickens every year. So having this relationship with the government where they provide us with some vaccines, I think is also very helpful. Quite recently, the government, district government has allocated us for free a huge piece of land where we hope to build um, um, accommodation for, for the lion scholars in, in, in the headquarters in Mekula, which is uh, critical for, for the future. Of, uh, of, of, of people here in Yas. Thank you. Just to add, so Agostina was talking about the Lion Scholars. So we have, um, you know, more than, we have about 47 a year of, of children who live in these remote villages who are in secondary school scholarships. Um, and many of them go on to other courses and some of them are now just graduating from university. And so when you're building these communities in these long-term projects, you know, it's, it's amazing to me to see kids that I've known since when you're there for 20 years, you see them from when they're really tiny and then you suddenly see them graduating at university and coming to work for you again. Um, you know, on our education team, Olga is our first girl who managed to get through and she did a public health and environmental management diploma and came back onto our education team. And it's, it's great to see these sort of cycles going through with the people who actually live in the ASA and trying to give them a future. And, and conservation often has taken away of lots of rights of people. Um, and so just trying to find a way to make sure that they are part of, of the decision making and they are part of helping us find the solutions um, together. Great, it's great to know that they're supportive. Um, we have a couple of related questions here from David. When someone is killed by a lion, is killing the animal the only compensation that will satisfy the human population? And then Abaktar asks if there's any incentives arriving from the human fatalities or, or livestock depredation. So in terms of uh, lions killing people, I think that um, as, a, as an organization, we believe that that lion needs to be killed. Lions often develop a culture of killing. They can do it in prides. It's not always old lions or injured lions, but definitely a lion that's killed a person. People are very easy to catch. Um, it's very likely that it will happen again. Um, so um, we have a sort of zero tolerance. If a lion kills a person, then we try and make sure we identify the lion and we kill that lion immediately. If it is livestock, then we always, we have killing the animal is always the last resort um, when it's taking livestock or it's wandering around a village. We try everything else beforehand to be able to keep the lions away from goats, we have flashing lights, we have burmas, we have all sorts of other ways to do it. And um, we don't pay compensation to people 
um, but we do commiserate. So there is no compensation for a loss of a life and a livelihood, but we certainly do know how terrifying it is to live, to live with lions. And those attacks are fairly rare. Um, last year was unusual. And I think um, in many cases, those all happened in the Western part of the reserve um, where prey populations have probably declined. Because that's, that's often what happens is um, as prey declines, the lions start looking for other easy things to catch. And that's often where conflict comes comes to the fore. And it's never easy. And it's always traumatic for everybody involved. Yeah, I, it's, it's one of those things that I know is one of the most difficult parts of being a conservationist is, is you don't want to lose any lion. But there are sometimes instances where um, what we feel emotionally is not what we need to be doing. Um, we have a comment from Tammy that says, I believe that one of our deep disconnects between peoples and animals and land is due to the dismissal of elders. Uh, no conversations, no handed down memories of connection with sacred places except our tribal peoples. You and I were actually just talking about this, about that connection to the land. Maybe you could talk a bit about how you feel that plays into coexistence. Yeah, um, I, I, if Agashina is still there, he can also tell some of the stories. And, and I think that the one of the, I'll start and then I'd like him to, to add to that. But, you know, one of the most astonishing things that we've seen is our Lion Festival. So it started, I think it's like 13 years ago now. And, and initially we started it, it happens in November, to see what activities would reach the children in the communities that were related to Lion. And as the years have gone on, it's become, it isn't our festival anymore. It's entirely led by our local team and it's become the community's festival. And they decide what dances and what things are happening. And as that's happened, they are, you'll saw that picture of the lion and the guy, the hunter guy. And those stories are coming up there. And a lot of the children are saying, I've never seen that theater before. I've never seen that dance before. And so the elders are starting to use these opportunities of a conservation lion festival to reaffirm those values, bring those dances back. And it's a wonderful thing to see. And I think that it's really, really important that we never forget that those elders hold hold the stories and hold hold the, the culture and, and the connection with the land and with the lands that might have been forgotten um, in all this mess of, you know, civil war and colonialism and colonial war and, and insecurity. And another just quick example of Indigenous knowledge is that recently um, Cyclone Freddy came through the Asa Reserve and oh, everybody's camps flooded um, and it was the worst flood in 50 years, according to the community. But our camp actually had very little damage. And the reason why was when we built it, we asked the elders. They chose the site for us, for our headquarters and our environmental center. And they could remember a flood that had happened 50 years ago. And so we were actually um, less damaged than many other people because of their indigenous knowledge. Fantastic. Agustino? Um, yes, I think uh, um, part of the disconnection uh, with uh, with wildlife can be is is becoming more and more clear now. Uh, as we see more and more prides of lions around the villages, so one amazing one thing that may uh, I mean I find amazing is how people appreciate when they see lions in the in the fields at night because uh, uh, during crop season there are serious problems with the uh, bush pigs um, uh, yeah bush pigs who base crop rate food but when people know that lions are around they know that they will be able to have a, a calmer night so they they will, the bush pigs will all go away because lions are around. So people love, like, like lions. So there is an interesting connection here between the presence of lions in, in the fields with food security, which means that the more lions you have in your field at night, less food you lose to, 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 to bush pigs. So another interesting point is related to, I mean, comes from 
Eusébio, who Pauline mentioned in this presentation, is, uh, I mean, I mean, it was so beautiful that he took the initiative that he wanted the kids from his village. I'm talking kids with the seven to 10 years to have deep connections with lions. So in the middle of the meeting, he decided that I am starting a program now. He did not consult anyone. He just decided on himself. And as a result of that, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of kids, almost 100, had the opportunity to go out with Eusebio, radio track lines, seed lines in peaceful env environment. So I think uh, there is a really, a, a, a very important lesson here on this, the role that these, that the people like Eusebio are playing, helping to use the, the, the research, the, the line mon monitoring to reaffirm these values, to reaffirm these connections. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, just taking a step back and thinking about lion populations in, in total, Sly's so asking roughly how many lions are there in the whole world and, and mostly in Africa, of course, but. Mm. Yeah, so we, there are only about 23,000 lions left, which is kind of astonishing. It's you know, side of, size of a, a stadium, I guess. Um, I always try and think of something that, that looks like 23,000 23, lions. Um, they have you know, declined from, I think, more than 90% of their range. Um, there are about seven populations that are in the sort of 1,000 lion level um, and then there are some smaller ones there are quite a few fenced populations that are doing quite well but definitely lions across Africa particularly in northwest and central Africa um, we are very concerned about and you know WCN has the amazing lion recovery fund which I also am very um very proud of the lion recovery fund and the incredible work that Peter Lindsay does there um, and that is a way to be able to support lion recovery across the whole the whole of Africa. Um, and you know, there, there are many amazing projects there. And anyone who's interested should have a look at all the incredible um, projects there are across across Africa for lions. Um, so yeah, that's 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 the other side of WCN trying to not just support Iwasa lions and Niasa lion project, but this much bigger this much bigger um, purpose to be able to recover lions across the continent. Yeah, we're, we're really excited about the work that happens with the LRF. A um, couple of people are asking questions around, you know, you mentioned that the human population went from, what was it, 15 to 60,000 people in the reserve. And if the human population is growing, how do we balance growing lion populations with that? Yeah, and I think there are two answers to that. Um, I, I just, you know, I think we'll, we'll add to what I'm going to say. I would say that the, the first part of this is that um, we will need to find a carrying capacity for lions that is, you know, when you, people talk about a carrying capacity, how many lions can an area um, support? And I think that the carrying capacity in Niasa has to be one that is, um, that can support people as well. So we don't want so many lions there that the conflict gets completely out of control. And we don't want too few lions there that the lions then go locally extinct. There's always been a balance between lions and people. And I think that we'll be able to find a way to do that. But I also think that um, obviously population growth is something that comes up a lot. Um, it's going to take a lot of land use planning to make sure um, that people are in very defined areas. They're not all over the reserve. And I think that as we provide education and other livelihoods, people urbanize. Um, most, many people don't want to live in the middle of nowhere. They would love to be able to live in a town and have a, a great future for their children and their children go to, to good schools. But that requires having skills to be able to do that. And to be able to have skills, you have to be able to go to school. And so education is kind of the foundation of, of all of this so that people can move out of Mias Reserve and find find another uh, livelihood. Um, Agostino, you want to add to that? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Good. Uh, I think uh, maybe the other aspect I would add to that point is, uh, I think we often focus on a uh, number of people. I think that is important, but it is equally important on how these people are living there. 
okay? Because if we have, uh, and that's where uh, the work that the uh, Niasa Karnov project does is so important. If you look uh, in the, uh, there are areas where people are living with the high density of lions, but there are areas where you have um, lower density of, uh, of lions, more, I mean, recently our team went outside of the reserve. I mean, there was areas with lower density of lions where people basically don't, don't, don't know how to live with lions. People kind of forgot, have forgotten these connections. People have forgotten about things like Sanjas. So I think uh, if, if we add the how to that question, probably we can uh, make a good progress. And I think what, what Colleen said in terms of education, it's really important that uh, the, the, to, to, uh, the education of the woman particularly, because when you educate the woman in other options, I mean, you are giving her options. You are giving her options and often, women tend to have less children, which, which somehow helps reducing or controlling the, the growth, growth of human population. Thank you. Wonderful. That actually, you started to answer sort of one of the next questions that I was going to ask was from Tracy. Of, um, have you found the balance between maintaining the area's flora and the animal needs with the human needs? And how do you balance all of these things? And you know, what do people living in the protected area, what do they do? What's their impact on the land? And most of the people living in the yes, are subsistence farmers. Um, they used to be able to hunt as well, you know, local hunters for, for food, but that was stopped when it was declared a, a reserve. There's a lot of fishing, which provides very important protein for people, and they live very close to the land. Um, there is the, the critical point here is that human well-being is linked to lion well-being. If we can get people out of abject poverty in the asses so that their well-being is, that they have um, opportunities for good health and good security and good education, then they're able to have an imagination for the future and design the future that they want. But when people are worrying about what their next meal is going to be, then you can't have a conversation about conservation. And so part of the role of a conservation organization such as ourselves is to create these small alternative livelihoods. And um, that's what the reserve is doing as well to find ways for people to be able to secure their livelihoods, increase their well-being, because then you can have conversations and you can work together to find solutions. Um, I did see one of the other questions was about how many villages there are in the reserve. There, there are 40 between, there are about 44 villages and they're often along the roads. So when you drive into Nias Reserve, you think, oh my goodness, there are people everywhere. But actually when you look at it from an aeroplane, we have a little small plane that fly around in, you can see that it's a very small proportion of Nyasa that's actually being transformed by people. And it's absolutely possible to find ways for livelihoods for people and for a life for lands, I believe. That's great. Agustino, any additional thoughts there? No, I think I think Colleen touched on, on the main points. So I think we can move to the next question. Thank you. Great. Um, just looking through a couple of these questions real quick. Um, can you talk about how, you know, if populations are declining, how do we see coexistence as a strategy that's working? And what are some of the other strategies that work as well? Are you seeing that? Um, yeah, I think, uh... The key point is uh, is to understand that this, uh, although you have, um, for the particular case of Nias, although you, you have um, some, you, you might have a general trend of decline um, in some extent, I think you, you have to understand that um, uh, this, uh, that, 
you have different areas or that the populations are performing different in different areas. So uh, where there is good coexistence, in general, you, you tend to have uh, slow or less decline. Okay, and I gave I gave an example of an area where people kind of forgot have forgotten how to live with lions, and uh, next to that area, you there is an uh, there is an area called uh, Mavago, where uh, basically the coexistence is 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 it's a, a bit more challenging, and that's where uh, you have uh, you tend to see a, a bigger decline. Uh, because uh, uh, you have things like um, uh, uh, illegal wildlife trade playing a role. So people don't have many uh, alternatives in some areas. So I think it's, it's, it, it is quite a complex uh, aspect and we need to look at uh, different angles. But to summarize, I think that, that if you have good coexistence, you have good chance of stop or reducing the, the decline of populations of wildlife. Great. And just to that, um, you know, in 2012, we tended for a concession inside Niasa. So we, we work across the whole of the reserve, and then there are also these tourism concessions inside it. And with the, the traditional leaders of a community who were placed you know, often these, these lines are drawn quite arbitrarily. So inside this concession was a village of 2,000 people. And we have been partnering with them for the last 10 years to manage this 58,000 hectare piece of land. And um, it is extraordinary to see that the lion prides have gone from two prides to seven prides, that we've seen the cub survival go up dramatically. We're starting to see prides look like they should from just being one or two females to having six or seven uh, adults with all the sub adults in them and looking like a proper pride. We are seeing all the game around the village again because what we have is a system of conservation performance payments. So the community are earning money from good conservation action. They've built a community tourism camp where all the revenue goes into the community. All the visitors who come to the environmental center, if they see lions or they see elephants or buffalo or leopard, money goes into the community. And so once you have those partnerships that actually support coexistence, We've got very good evidence to show that the lion population has increased, the leopards have increased. We're starting to see we've got African wild dogs breeding behind the environmental center, and that's coexistence with people. That's with people living inside the area that's in their home. Um, and that, to me, is the future of conservation, um, is to provide ways for people to generate income, future, and to maintain their cultural heritage with wildlife. Absolutely, so important. Um, you know, you're mentioning mentioning the the cultural heritage, and you know, we have to be so respectful of the rights of the people of Mozambique and, and for their land. Um, noticed a few questions, comments about moving people from the reserve or from the lions, and you know, that's really something we look to to not do in conservation. Maybe you could speak to why that is. Well, I think we have a history of fortress conservation across the world, and it hasn't been particularly successful. Um, it has been successful in a few key protected areas, but for many of the protected areas, particularly in Africa, it's been against human rights. There are people, often it increases their poverty levels when they moved out. They are taken away from their land. And often you have these hard boundaries where you have these national parks or protected areas with all the people outside. You look at Kruger National Park for, for an example of this beautiful protected area and then hundreds of thousands of people that have been crammed into the boundaries there. And if people aren't included into the future of the place, whether they're outside or whether they're inside, then I don't think that there is a long-term future for conservation. And as... As we look at these declining populations of wildlife, we have lots of wildlife that's living with people in community areas. And so we need to find solutions that work for both. Often the protected area can be a little core area in, in, in the middle, and that can be your source population. 
And then all around there are places where you have wildlife and people, and that's where coexistence comes into its own. So I think we have to move away from, my opinion is move away from just one paradigm for conservation, move away from militarized conservation, and find other ways to be able to make sure that social justice is part of conservation. Because conservation has done some really terrible stuff in the past. We need to be able to look forward to a much more just future for conservation. I think that's a beautifully said, Colleen. Um, August, do you know any thoughts on that concept? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. I think, and I think we, we should see these communities also as part of the society. They are an important part of society. And uh, uh, so basically, we, we live in democratic society, and whatever we do should be. As should follow the norms, should, should be acceptable. So we cannot create conservation areas that do not have support from society because these protected areas, these conservation areas, at the end of the day, should serve society benefits as well. So thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, and just, just an example the other day, which is not to do with lions, but um, that sort of just brings it home is is two elders in a village the other day found an elephant that had died naturally and actually um, reported it to the, to the reserve authority to say, hey, there's an elephant with all these tusks there. Um, and they were able to go there and take those tusks and put them into safekeeping. Now, if you're not having coexistence and you're not having the communities as your partners, then there's absolutely no reason for someone to, to do that. They can make a huge amount of money, more than many years of salary or fishing or anything else to just sell that ivory or to sell land parts. And so the communities are actually our best defense for outsiders that might come in for the illegal wildlife trade. Um, when we have insecurity in the reserve, it's the communities and the fishermen that tell us when the outside is there that nobody knows. And we can work together to be able to find these solutions. That's great. Um, we have time for just a few more questions. And one that I think is really important actually is Michelle's asking, where are the funds that go to Nyasa being spent and what are your needs? Yeah, that's a good question. And thank you for asking that. So our budget's about 2.4 million US dollars. We don't have a fundraising person. Obviously, we have WCN who helps us hugely and a number of other donors like the Eastern Zoo, Hogel Zoo, and many others who help us. All that money, 100% um, of the donations come into our not-for-profit. We have a not-for-profit foundation and then go directly into the field. So we don't have an office anywhere. We don't, you know, we don't take overhead for that. It goes into the salaries of 112 people who are there on the ground. A lot of conservation is done by sitting under a mango tree and having a conversation. It goes into our lion collars, our vehicles, vaccinations education programs. We have an environmental center where we bring children out to be able to spend time in the field. Um, we have very, um, led, led by Ludencia, who does incredible outreach out in all the villages across the reserve um, and many different alternative livelihood programs. So all our, our, our 2022 annual reports not out yet, will be out this quarter, but our, all our other reports are all on our website. Everyone moans at me because they're too long but we believe in complete transparency. You can see exactly where your money goes, see exactly what we do. And you can just get hold of us as well. Just ask us questions, we're happy to answer. I think that's one of the most important things is I know you guys are always willing to engage and answer those questions. Um, we have a lot of questions that we haven't been able to get to yet. So we'll follow up with people on those. But I wanted to see if you and Agostino had any kind of lasting thoughts on what coexistence looks like into the future and what support you need to make that happen. Agostino, you go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. So uh, I think uh, my comment will be uh, like if we have happy people, we have happy lions. So we, I think it's critical that uh, we, a lot of things that we have spoken today, I mean, 
although I mean they are related to, to lions, it's clear that we achieve that through working with people. And the people are the center part of it as the lions are. So the two are not separate. And um, yeah, I think uh, the more we can do for the communities here, we'll be able to uh, improve uh, the conservation of, 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 of lines and we'll be able to improve the coexistence in, in the future. So this, this, these are my, my words. Thank you. Great. And that's why I wanted him to go first because he did it very beautifully. Um, I think that my final word would be that it's um, a mistake to believe that coexistence is only important in the Yas Reserve in Mozambique or, or, or in one of these WCN conservationist projects. The, the how, how you look at your garden, everything that every, every bit of our responsibility to look after our planet relies on coexistence right now. So conservation is a responsibility of every single person in this room, whether you work in a protected area or not, because there are many species around us. And that's kind of my message. And so if it matters to you, then it matters to the communities out there because people are part of nature. And I think that that message has been lost. We've separated ourselves out and actually we are part of nature and there's lots to learn from the people who are still very deeply connected to it. Once again, Colleen, if I could bottle you, we could save the world. I'm just absolutely sure of it. In 20 years of doing this work myself, I think one of the things that I repeat most is something you said many years ago, which is hungry people can't care about wildlife. And it's just so important that we're taking care of both people and wildlife, because when we do that, then everybody thrives. Um, I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Um, Megan put her email in the chat. So if you have any questions or lingering thoughts, please feel free to share them with her and she'll get them out to Colleen and Agostino. Um, I want to remind you all that our Spring Expo is coming up on April 22nd in Palo Alto. So if you're local to California, we hope you'll join us then. Fortunately, Colleen and Agostino will not be there, but they will be joining us in October on, I think it's the... 13th, I believe, October 13th-ish, that, that week um, for Expo. And then also a reminder that our next Closer Look is coming up soon on May 19th, and it will be Spectacle Bear Conservation talking about their new work in Machu Picchu, which is pretty incredible. So again, thank you all for being here with us today, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, WCA, and we so appreciate you, your fam, our family on the other side of the world. It's our pleasure to be able to yeah. support thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, WCN, uh, for everything you do beyond our expectations. So we know that you are always there for us. And yeah, thank you. And we appreciate that you, you do that for many other conservation organizations who are also in need for, for that support. Much appreciated. Oh, and I will say that when you guys say WCN, you're speaking to not just those of us at WCN, but all of us here on this call. You're all a part of WCN. And until next time, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>